welcome to yet another edition, another episode of Disassembly with your servant of Yahuwah, Soya. And we're going to jump right back into this again. We're in verse chapter 19, starting with verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take Eth your woman and Eth your two daughters, which are here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. I want to thank the Father for allowing us to be here today. Thank him for his son, Yahusha, whose name is the only name by which we can be saved by the Father. And I'd like to say thank you, and let us get started. The sun was up. Maybe. It could just been... It could just have been some time past sunset. They accounted for a day during this time as the period from sunrise to sunset. So for them, evening could have been a period just prior, just after, I mean, sunset. Morning could have been directly after sunset. I don't know. Like we recognize it after midnight. Like we recognize it after midnight. Or... Morning could have been several hours later and just before sunrise. Either way, this passage suggests that much time went by, or at least some time went by. In fact, it says morning arose, which suggests sunrise. That means Lot literally had all night to leave with all of his family, which included his sons-in-law. Now, the angels have narrowed their focus of his family. Perhaps they overheard his talks with his sons-in-law. Maybe they recognized his poor relationships with these men, with these two men and his daughter. Perhaps these two men were natural residents of the city of Sedum. The angels recognized something going on with these two men, Lot and his daughters. It was something they did not see as viable, see them as viable, and cut them out of their plans. So, they are prompting Lot to leave with just his woman and their daughters to keep them safe from the ways of this city, to keep them closer to Yahuwah, to keep them away from the destruction that was coming. That sort of says that his sons-in-law are already consumed in the ways, the iniquity of the city. Verses 16 and 17. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his woman, and upon the hand of his two daughters, Yahuwah being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for your life, look not behind you, neither stay in all the circle of the Yardan. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. These two angels were ambassadors of Yahuwah. Their actions were the actions of Yahuwah. They took it upon themselves as acting re representatives of Yahuwah to remove Lot and his family from the city. Between the two of them, they had four arms and they used them to take hold of each individual and take them out of the city. The wording here is very interesting. The writer says that they were brought forth, then sent outside of the city. It almost sounds as though they were taken out of the house, then flown out of the city and sat down in a safe location. Whatever is exactly being conveyed here, aside from the removal of Lot from danger, it sounds strange reading into the word. Now, verse 17 suggests that it took more time to get them out than flying would have taken, unless they flew slowly. It sounds as though they walked or ran them out of the city. It sounds like they went out on foot. That brings about an interesting question. How did they get past the crowd? The home was surrounded first by all the men of the city. Next, everyone else of the city were there around the men. All of that from, and it came to pass. Yahuwah did not just take them to safety. He gave them a command and warning. He told them to escape for their lives. The thing is, he just removed them from the immediate danger of the city. They were no longer in this city. 
I think he's telling them to escape the influence of this city and to seek their lives, their future, elsewhere. I think he's telling them that the ways of this city are not confined to this city. It seems as though these ways are being practiced by the entire circle of the Jordan. The circle of the Jordan likely encompasses all the cities surrounding the Dead Sea, what we call now the Dead Sea. Maybe that's why it's called the Dead Sea. We'll get to that in a moment. The southern end of the Jordan River. He told them to escape to the mountain. He probably did not mean Mount Sidon. He may have referred to today's so-called Judean mountains. The warning is so that they are not consumed. Consumed by what? We'll get to that. Verses 18, 19, and 20. And Lot said unto them, O, oh, not so, my Adonai. Behold now, your servant has found grace in your sight, and you have magnified your mercy, which you have showed unto me in saving eth my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Not only did Lot have the gall to talk back to Yahuwah, but he had the gall to ask to have things his own way. I don't know whether he was scared out of his, out of his, his shape or worried about bands of murderers. Lot is intent on going to this little city. Perhaps it was filled with people similar to those of the circle of the Jordan. And Lot is familiar with these people despite their depravity. He may have come to appreciate, like, and even accept their ways of living. He may even long to resume that lifestyle. You know, whether or not he's out of shape or he likes the lifestyle, he seems to be um, exhibiting or perhaps becoming or showing the side of him that is much like that of the annoying side of Abraham. All right. Verse 21, verses 21 and 22. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted you concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow Eth this city for which you have spoken. Make haste, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till you are come thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Tesoar. Looking at his words, it sounds as though this city was going to be destroyed along with the rest. But because Lot petitioned him that he be allowed to flee there, Yahuwah allows it and spares the city. The city is so close, in fact, that he cannot even begin his work on destroying the others until Lot and his family have actually made it into the city proper. Verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Tesoar. Even after being taken, escorted out of Saddam by the two angels, Lot still had a considerable distance to travel before making it to Tesoar. Now the sun had risen, and it was about midday since the new day starts at sunset. Now, just to point out real quick, the angels had left behind the, the two men of his two daughters. You know, even though they obviously had some sort of uh, ceremony, some sort of traditional um, um, event that occurred to bind them together, they probably had not consummated the, the union and therefore was probably the reason why they had been uh, left behind by the two angels. Aside from which, they probably were um, from the, the city, from the circle, and Yahuwah uh, was probably not very keen on saving you know, two people that came from the circle. You know, who, I don't really know, but you know, it sounded like something was off about these two men and the relationship with Lot's daughter. Okay, verses 24 and 25. Then Yahuwah rained upon Sedom 
and upon Amorah brimstone and fire from Yahuwah out of the heavens. And he overthrew Eth those cities and Eth all the circle of the Jordan and Eth all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Yes, Yahuwah destroyed Sedom and Amorah. He also destroyed all the cities in the circle of the Jordan. All the cities that surrounded what we now call the Dead Sea, all of those cities were destroyed during this event. Here's a question. How did he rain down brimstone and fire? Did he command the armies, the angels, to dispense the brimstone and fire? Did he do it himself as king? Whatever the specifics, the credit, the responsibility was his. It all happened in his will. It says that he overthrew all the inhabitants. That is to say that he killed them all. Now, many today say, I serve a good um, L. <laughs> that is true. But understand this and consider the events and the individuals. He is good based on his own standard. If you believe on, have faith in, and revere him, then you will say that he is good because you accept and yield to his will and ways. However, there is another side to be aware of. The people on the other end of that may not share your perspective, and particularly when they are on the receiving end of his fury. They probably will not agree with you as you are about to die, as far as they are about to die. And he spared none living. He killed all the animals, birds, and creepy things too. And to be completely thorough, he did not discriminate. And he killed all the plant life as well. He is very good. And this was a good day. All right, verse 26, and we're going to wrap this up. But his woman looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. If only that could happen today. <laughs> All right. This verse is situated strangely here, although it is in proper chronology. I say that because the drama of the past few verses almost make you forget that this refers back to the command, the warning given in verse 17. So much drama has built between verses that if you do not keep focused, it is easy to forget what came before. Here we see that Lot's woman is like us. She got caught up in the drama as well as the surrealness of what she was living and failed to be obedient. She failed to guard the command of Yahuwah in her heart and she looked back. Her disobedience, her lack of respect and reverence is immediately punished by Yahuwah. Even today, even today, this is what Yahuwah can do to us for our lack of obedience. Why he does not is a mystery. Or perhaps it is our perception that does not allow us to see what he is doing as either punishment or reward. Perhaps we are bound by our beliefs, experiences, culture, ideologies, etc. All that says that we are bound by religion. Religion is equated to any ideology, belief, or circumstance that prevents, limits, and or retards your freedom to see, think, and feel what is holy being presented to you in any capacity. It is not limited to a particular faith in any deity. In this instance, the religion that convinced Lot's woman to hold something higher in esteem than Yahuwah was ironically the very punishment that Yahuwah was unleashing. She believed in that event so much that she forgot, disregarded Yahuwah's command, warning to her that she lifted up those cities being devastated, the people, animals, plants, and all living in those cities, the fire and brimstone, she lifted them up above Yahuwah, turned to see her new commander, disobeyed Yahuwah, and received her reward. This too was a stupendous show of power. How could a man, a living soul, be instantly turned, transformed into salt. Utterly amazing and terrifying. 
Lastly, and perhaps this isn't the beginning, perhaps we need to take this a little bit further. Perhaps those people, those uh, practicers, practitioners of rape of other men, practitioners of uh, distorting the ways of Yahuwah, perhaps they deserve what they got. Yeah, I said it, perhaps they deserve what they got. Perhaps, perhaps they just needed a rest, a rest from life, a, 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 a rest from living, a rest from destroying the ways of Yahuwah. Perhaps, perhaps they needed to get away from Lot and his family because Lot and his family was trying to change their ways. Perhaps there's another side to this story that we're not getting here. Perhaps they deserved it. What do you deserve? Why do we even use that word? They wouldn't think they deserve it. Today when somebody gets shot, they say, oh, he didn't deserve that. She didn't deserve that. No, she didn't deserve to get raped. He didn't deserve to get run over. He didn't deserve to get beat by the police. Who are you to say what anybody deserves? Who am I to say what I deserve? Why are we using that word? Perhaps we need to take this a little bit farther. Perhaps we need to look at these words we're using so, so freely and reevaluate. Perhaps it is Yahuwah who decides what we get. And it's not about what we deserve, it's just what he decides. Perhaps there are other Elohim, you know, quote unquote, other gods that decide what we get at any given time. And they have the power to carry it out. Perhaps.